This is a recorded version of a talk by Sender Sigma 2010. My name is Wolfgang Gatterbauer and this is trying to work with Dan Sutro. The focus of this talk is a principal solution to automatic conflict resolution in community databases if we have trust mappings. The problem is best explained with an example and for this we use the Indoscript. Archaeologists have found samples of writing in what is today eastern Pakistan, northwestern India from a civilization that lived about 4,000 years ago and archaeologists know very little about this Indus civilization. They have found writings in the form of symbols called glyphs, and to this day many of those are undeciphered despite various claims of decipherment. So here we give an example of a symbol of a glyph, and there are three scientists called Papola, Mahadevan and Knorozov, which we just call here by Alice, Bob and Charlie, who gave three different interpretations of what the symbol may actually refer to. We can model this agreement of beliefs with the help of key violations. Here we can assume that Bob, Alice and Charlie have their own individual databases and they may disagree on certain keys. So here we have keys and values. For the same key, this particular symbol, Alice, Bob and Charlie have different values. Now, in addition to their own databases, Alice, Bob and Charlie may have certain trust mappings, trust mappings to other users of the system. And the basic idea is that if Alice doesn't know the value of a certain key, she may trust Bob and Charlie. And in case they disagree, she trusts Bob with a high priority. So she trusts Bob more than Charlie. Now, based on these trust mappings, she can import beliefs from other users. And this beliefs can also travel for the whole system based on transitive closure. So what we like to distinguish is between explicit and implicit beliefs. Explicit beliefs are those ones which are held by the individual use of the system based on individual observations. And implicit beliefs are those ones which are imported based on these trust mappings. Very similar to the concepts of extensional database predicates and intentional database predicates in data log. Now, based on these ideas, Based on the slides, there have been a number of proposals for community databases. Orchestra at the time was really one of the state-of-the-art systems which proposed all of the different ideas that we see on this slide. So this is great, but certain things can go wrong. And we're going to look at two examples to illustrate what can go wrong. Assume that Charlie at a certain time step inserts an explicit belief, and in the next time step, Alice imports this belief. Now, at time step three, also Bob has a certain, inserts a certain belief, but now look at what's happened. Alice has already imported a belief from Charlie, but actually she would have preferred and trusted the one belief by Bob more, but now it's too late. So what you observe is that actually the order of the inserts have an impact on the semantics, and we may not want that. Here's another example. Similarly, Charlie imports a belief, Alice further in, in imports this belief, gets this from Charlie, further propagates this further to Bob. And now in the next time step, Charlie says, oops, I made a mistake, let me change it. At this time, Alice won't be able to update this because she trusts Bob more and Bob has a child also in the system. So somehow she got, she lost this connection of the provenance where the different beliefs come from. So we want to avoid this. So the focus of this talk is how can we define a principled semantics that avoids any of these problems we just illustrated here? And then, further, how can we actually calculate this in an efficient way, which is non-trivial? And furthermore, we're going to see how we can add certain extensions to negative beliefs. And this three parts will also form the three parts of our talk. First, let's discuss how can we define a principled solution to the automatic conflict solution in the presence of preferred trust mappings. So for the purpose of exposition, we're going to focus on binary trust networks. Binary means any user can have maximal two other users from which they import their beliefs. This is no restriction. In the appendix of paper, we show very easily how you can extend the ideas to arbitrary number of parents, but it's easier to describe. Furthermore, we're going to focus only on one key. Why? Because the problem of which value should be 
propagated in what way for the system is really independent across different keys. So we're going to have here then four nodes. For each of the nodes, we may have one or two parents. We may have some nodes that already have an explicit belief. A believes V, B believes W. Those two don't have any explicit beliefs. Our questions will, what should they believe? And we have here preferred parents. Preferred parents or non-preferred parents, preferred are the ones which have a higher priority than the non-preferred one. So we now focus on one key and want to assign, want to find a principal solution to assigning values to each of the nodes in the network that doesn't have an explicit belief. And our proposed semantics is based on stable models, which are known from answer set programming. So the basic idea is the following. Is we want to find an assignment of values to a node such that each node has a belief that has a non-dominated lineage to an explicit belief. Non-dominated means at every step in the derivation, we will never choose a non-dominating parent whose value is dominated by some other value. So for example, n4 here could also have v. This is not dominating because it's the same value. And we can still trace v back to an explicit belief. So if you apply this idea here now on the right side on the cycle, we could, for example, assign both d and c v. Because at each step, here we have the preferred parent, v instead of w. And here, the preferred one is also v, and we have a lineage back to v. So one stable solution would be to assign both c and d the value v. Another stable model is to assign both w. In this case, we still have the same condition fulfilled that each value can be traced back to an explicit belief with a non-dominating lineage. So the idea what we further propose is to use a possible certain semantics that is also known from database repairs. So basically, each stable solution determines for each node a possible value. A possible value. Here, for example, for C, we have seen we have two different stable models, in one in which C has the value V, in the other one, W. Now, certain values are now the intersections of all stable solutions per user. Since we've seen that C can have values v and w, and each of them is justified in one stable model, the certain solutions is the empty set. So what we want is we want to find for each of the nodes in the network the possible solutions. Now, logic programs, they provide an expressive language for exactly representing and specifying the different ways in which a system stabilizes after satisfying the trust relationships. So here is now how we can write this situation as a logic program. We have C with two parents, the dominating parent A and the non-dominating parent B. Now what we know is that if A has a value, then C should have the same value. So if A has a possible value, A has value X, P for possible, then C should also have this as possible value. Now, what happens if we know a possible value for B? For this, we need to first calculate the non-allowed values. So non-allowed value is if B has a value that is in conflict with a value from A, then C should not have that value. So here's the way we do it. If there is a value Y for B and X for C and they are different, then we remember for C that B has a value Y that cannot be used. And in the second part, we say whenever there's a value in B that is not a conflict, a blocked value, then uh, C can actually believe this. And the, the, the great thing about these logic programs are that there, there are existing tools, powerful and free logic program are solvable to exactly encode and calculate now the possible and certain values of a logic program. And in the past, there have been previous works that propose some variants of this different semantics. The problem with this is that 
solving logic programs under the stable model semantics is, is hard. Here we use DLB, the state of the art logic programming solver, and we see as we make the network bigger and bigger, please notice here the log scale, it takes an exponential time to find the possible values of the um, uh, the possible values for each of the nodes in the network. So surprisingly, we actually find uh, and we propose in this in this in this work a p-time solution to this automatic conflict resolution problem. Before we go there, let me first show you how you can encode this real DLV. So here we have an example network. Notice it is not binary. Therefore, the encoding for each of the nodes is a little bit bigger. But again, this is the details you can see in the appendix. Um, this is the program. This is the input. In addition to the network, we have also encoded the possible values, the explicit beliefs for certain nodes. For example, H8 believes 1, H8 believes 1, and 11 believes 0, 11 believes 0. We run the program by saying is, hey, find all the possible values for all nodes. We run this, and then we get the result here. And this here, for example, says 4 can have possible value 0, 4 can also have possible value 1. So now, can we actually solve this in a more efficient way than the state-of-the-art logic programming solver? So we now discuss the resolution algorithm. This means an algorithm that can find the solution to the problem we just discussed in guaranteed polynomial time, where the existing state-of-the-art logic programming solvers need exponential time in the worst case. We just have an example, a simple binary trust network. But we want at the end of the algorithm, we want for each of the nodes in the network, the set of possible values. The algorithm proceeds as follows. We have two sets. The closed set, this means the set of nodes for which we already know what the possible values are, and we have the open set. The open sets are those ones for which we don't know what the values can be. Now, we have two steps. The first step, whenever we have an edge that is a preferred edge that crosses the border from the closed set to the open set, then we know we can follow this and we can directly propagate the value from the parent to the child. And we can repeat this. We can repeat this as long as there are edges that cross the frontier. And now we're stuck. Now we're stuck because we don't have any more a preferred edge that crosses from the close to the open set. For what we do now next, now we need to make a quick tour and talk about strongly connected components in a graph. For this result, we build upon Tarshan's algorithm. And this is the following result, the important result is that for every directed graph, whether it's cyclic or acyclic, the graph that is formed by looking at all the strongly connected components, treating them each as one node, this resulting graph is itself a directed acyclic graph, and it can be calculated in linear time of the size of the graph. This means uh, number of nodes and edges, and therefore number of edges. So here, let's look at the example. Here we have a graph. If you look at and try to derive what are the strongly connected components, we're going to find that there are four strongly connected components. Remember, a strongly connected component is a set of vertices that can reach each other. And there we have four. C, for example, can reach E, but it can never reach A and D. So if you now look at the graph that is formed by contracting each of the strongly connected components into one vertice, four into this, three into this, and one into that, then the resulting graph is itself a direct the cyclic graph. And what we know, and that's the important result we need to use in the next step, is that every DAG has at least one minimal node. A minimal node is one that has no incoming edge. So what we're going to look for in the next step is we're going to use the result that for any graph, we can determine in linear time a minimal strongly connected component, which is one that has no incoming edge from any node outside of that strongly connected component. So remember, here we are stuck. Now what we can do now is 
we can run Tarshan's algorithm on the graph, on the open graph. And what we're guaranteed to create is we are guaranteed to get at least one root strongly connected component. This is a, an, um, a set of nodes that are strongly connected and for which there is no other node in the open set that has an incoming edge into the strongly connected component. So the only edges that can come into the strongly connected component, the root strongly connected component, this set of nodes, are non-preferred edges from the closed set. And now we have exactly a variant on the, on the intuitive example we saw from the beginning. For each of those values, we can have one stable model in which all of them have value v and another stable model in which all of them have the value w. So the next step we now, uh, the next step we take is to say, let's look at the roots to a connected component and flood. This means we take all of the incoming, the, the values we get from incoming non-dominated edges. And for each of them, we have a stable model with that value. Yeah, so we can put both value v and w into all of the nodes as a possible value. And then we can continue. We can continue and down we again stuck. There's no more preferred edge that crosses from close to open, but we can again run now Tarjan's algorithm. There's only one remaining strongly connected component and we can repeat the same argument. We have two edges. From one edge, we can get V, W, from the other one, U. So we know all of them can form a stable model. So now we are done. We know here we have all the free values for the known L. And if we now look at the complexity of this algorithm, we are guaranteed that the problem can be solved in polynomial time. Why? Because Tarshan's algorithm takes linear time. And the worst case we can imagine is that we have to run it a linear number of times. So in the worst case, the algorithm we just discussed has a worst case quadratic complexity. And we're going to see an example worst case, a construct example. But for any, for most reasonable graphs, this algorithm actually has a linear time complexity. So here's the example, the worst case. It's a worst case scenario in which our algorithm takes a quadratic time. We have here two values, v and w. We get stuck. We have to run Tarshan's algorithm on the remaining graph. We have two root strongly connected components. We can flood them with only one value each, v and w for the lower one. We continue, we again stuck. We continue with resolving the remaining nodes. We have the same situation. We again get stuck in the next point and repeat this a number of times. And in the worst case, this we have to run Tarshan's algorithm a linear number of times in, in the node in the number of the nodes in the graph. So here now some experiments. Here's like a very simple example with, with oscillators. So we have here the example situation from the introduction multiple times repeated and repeat the graph. For this simple example situation, DLV quickly, uh, quickly reaches a time that uh, you, you can't continue. But our algorithm intuitively scales in linear time. Here's a realistic example from some VEC graph. Here we also have linear scalability. And here's the worst case scenario for our algorithm, where we see that we indeed, our algorithm takes a quadratic number, a quadratic, has, a, has a quadratic time complexity. So great so far, we have an algorithm that solves the problem in polynomial time. This is great. So we know how to propagate uh, beliefs, positive beliefs. Now it gets interesting. Now we're going to talk about negative beliefs. And negative beliefs, the idea is that in addition to the values somebody believes in, we also want to propagate constraints. This means we want to restrict the possible values. So we want to filter the data based on values they accept. And what we're going to propose is three different types of semantics, three different ways we can reason about uh, managing such negative beliefs or constraints. So the question, the question you basically is have, what should C believe if the preferred parent says, I believe this is V 
And A says, I don't know what it is, but it should not be W. So we propose th three different uh, beliefs. The first one we call agnostic. Agnostic is a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known beyond material phenomena. So C in this case says, we already know it is V, so why should I remember anything else like it can't be W? We have another semantic, we call this eclectic. Eclectic is a person who derives ideas, style, taste from a broad and diverse range of sources. So here the eclectic C treats now both of the constraints and the, uh, the, the values equally and just incorporates all of the information and says, uh -huh, I know V is positive, it's V, and it's not W. Not W is not in conflict with, yes, it is V, and therefore it incorporates this and will also further propagate it. So these two different variations seem to make not a difference, but actually if you now think and construct an example that's longer and you propagate these values, it turns out whether or not we have the W, the negative constraint, and we propagate it, can make a difference. In this example, in this longer chain here, at the end, under an agnostic belief, J will believe W, and here J will believe U. So a different positive value than under, under the other semantics. So interesting is if we don't, important, if we don't have any cycles, then both of those semantics are in polynomial time, but if you have cycles, either of them is NP-complete. We also have a third semantic, which we call skeptic. A skeptic is a person inclined to question or doubt all accepted opinions. The difference for the skeptic one is here the following is. Here we follow in the first step the agnostic semantic. Now he either something different, namely, if D believes it is not V, and C believes it is V, then E will believe nothing actually. And here's the intuition. Together with the C, with the positive value of, of V, you can think about a positive statement also includes a negative statement for all the other values. So the preferred one, the preferred parent says it's not V, and the C says it's V, but that's dominated by the not V, but also says it's not any of the other possible values. So if you use now this semantic, E will believe no possible value, none of the values is possible. The interesting observation is now that this semantic actually can be calculated in guaranteed polynomial time, even for graphs with cycles, with a slight variation of the resolution algorithm. And because of the difference of complexity, this is our recommendation if you want to propagate both values and constraints. At this point, let me conclude the talk. Our research was motivated by how can we define a consistent semantic for the conflict resolution problem? We defined a semantic, a principled semantics, based on the stable solutions, on stable model semantics. Interestingly, we found a p-time algorithm for this problem, despite existing state-of-the-art logic problem solvers in the exponential time to solve and evaluate this semantic. And we proposed several extensions, one of which we discussed here, I mean negative beliefs, also constraints. We defined three semantics. Interestingly, two are hard and one is still in p-time on graphs with cycles. In the paper and report, you find several other extensions, how to deal with bulk inserts, how can you check if two different users agree, in at least one still model, can you also find the consensus values between two different users? How can you compute the, the lineage? For all this, please, and the report and these slides, please also visit our project webpage. Thank you.